Hello all, Rick here once more, heading back to look at a vessel that's been a long time coming. Before the United Federation of Planets, the Starfleet existed as the primary arm of exploration of the United Earth, before it was folded into the new interstellar government in 2161. The premier achievement of this organisation, in a technological standpoint, was the culmination of the Warp 5 programme, the NX-class starship. The real origins of the class were to be the main vessel of the prequel Star Trek show Enterprise, which was consistently set in a period of time far before the original series. In fact, the initial series was possibly to be set on Earth for the majority, with Season 1 following the construction of the starship. However, a more traditional setting was decided on, so the vessel was launched with the start of the show. The interiors were designed to be roomy, yet still evoke the feel of a submarine, while looking both like a more rudimentary version of the original series, and maintaining an aesthetic that did not look as if it was pulled from the 50s. Externally, when creating concepts for the vessel, Doug Drexler and Foundation Imaging was told not to go for the obvious and try new things. Some of these designs looked radically different from the familiar vessels of Star Trek, while others retained the silhouette. One option was to have the vessel coloured bronze again to differentiate it, but this was changed back to the traditional grey. John Eaves was initially brought on board to the project for concept art and created dozens of ideas before Drexler continued the work with 3D concepts. Eventually, the decision was made to make the Enterprise a single hull piece with nacelles, which informed the design process going on. The design that was chosen was based on a flipped Akira class, which suited the brief of creating a familiar looking vessel complete with all the iconic elements but in a position that was seldom seen, and never yet on a hero ship. TOS style elements were added around the vessels such as sensor domes and rotating bussard collectors to create the evolutionary link to later ships. This design process is flipped for the lore origin of the vessel with the NX class informing Starfleet designs going on. In universe, the NX class was the product of iterations of engine designs and multiple new technologies, the first of what I am going to term a poster ship of Starfleet. In this role, it personified the near pinnacle achievements of Starfleet at this time, much like the later Constitution, Galaxy or Odyssey class starships. The mission of the NX project was to thoroughly test out new and the only Warp 5 engine created by humans, and be mankind's publicised first forays into the exploration of what then was considered deep space. The name Enterprise was assigned to the first prototype of the class, with the rest of the line to be named after other Earth shuttlecraft. The NX project itself began in 2119, however at its inception, the Enterprise was nothing more than an ambiguous end goal. There were several prototypes that were designed to break Warp 2, while the NX Delta broke Warp 3 in 2144 and the Freedom class exceeded Warp 4. The NX vessels were all prototypes up until this point, establishing the prefix NX as the prototype designation. The actual prototype was launched in 2151 earlier than expected with several components not yet installed. However, these would be added in time and by the launch of the NX-02, the ship was more well equipped. Interestingly, the entire line can be treated as a prototype in reality. Every vessel constructed of the NX line was a massive project with some unique features and innovated off the previous models based on feedback. The line therefore would continue to evolve, even receiving a major overhaul with the birth of the Federation, the NX refit, which would go on to give rise to the iconic profile of Starfleet vessels. The breakthrough for the NX class to sustain high warp was found in the symmetrical warp field governor, 
which was situated between the nacelles. This was required because the nacelles, although the generators of the warp bubble, needed to be in exact equilibrium to function without tearing the ship apart. This was the result of numerous attempts in the past, so the governor effectively allowed for a slight margin of error to be compensated for without the slight variance leading to a catastrophic imbalance and complete collapse. Boom. Over its operation lifetime, the initial NX-01 acted as the testbed for many systems, and received upgrades every few years. Phase cannons were added alongside photonic torpedoes and improved hull armour in terms of defence. This was in response to the Zindi threat of 2153, while other improvements saw the deflector, sensor and computer systems overhauled with more advancements. The NX-01 was a flurry of innovations, changing its specs over its short lifetime, as were its sister ships. The primary shipyard was Starfleet's main San Francisco complex, with the Copernicus and Altracerus facilities lending support, with more support from the United Earth Space Probe Agency. The NX class was the largest vessel constructed by Starfleet at the time at 225 metres long, 135 wide and 33.3 metres tall across seven decks and weighing 80,000 tonnes, and was a sizeable investment for the growing Earth. So much so that the line had to be curtailed during the Earth Romulan War in favour of the older Intrepid and Daedalus class, but it was a much needed step. The NX class had a crew of around 83, but had facilities to carry more as well as modest diplomatic suites. However, space was at a premium on this ship, with much technology being bulkier than it would later become, so it had less habitable internal volume. The horizontal warp core was effectively a proven, but still a temperamental design that required consistent maintenance, but at the heart of the class. It's funny, after looking at all these later timeline ships to heap praise on a warp 5 engine, but at its time the NX was the fastest vessel Starfleet had ever produced, keeping up with most contemporary powers with the exception of the Vulcans. The Cochrane Archer Warp Core was rated for Warp 5 as a maximum and it could cruise at 4 for extended periods, while actually achieving Warp 5.2 with a well-maintained engine. In comparison, the Intrepid was pushing 3.5 at its time, and the, all the innovations unlocked through the NX project were retroactively implemented into the fleet, with other ships being overhauled and constructed with Warp 5 cores. It also relied on four SBD impulse drives and was decently manoeuvrable. The Annex was armed with three phase cannons, which were the precursors to phaser technology, basically the same thing. However, we have seen around five other locations that fire them, and it also housed six probe torpedo launchers, four four and two rear facing. Initially, it only had a complement of spatial torpedoes, before being armed with photonic torpedoes later on. It's notable for having no deflector shielding, a technology that was still in its infancy within Starfleet, instead using polarised hull plating, a much more primitive method of attempting to diffuse an energy weapon by breaking down its cohesion as it struck the hull, and then relying on plating. More torpedo launchers were added later on as one of the many modifications to the class. In terms of auxiliary craft, the NX-01 housed only two OTV Type K42 shuttle pods, which were dropped from its keel launch bay. Neither of these were warp capable. This is a limitation of the scale of the vessel and Starfleet's infancy with auxiliary craft being more common later on. The ship itself was capable of atmospheric flight for extended periods and could easily handle higher pressures, however it was not capable of landing outside of a crash. It also had a sensor dome, which would be a commonly recurring apparatus in Starfleet design, and two cargo bay doors above and below the saucer, and a third on the rear which could open into space for loading. 
while the NX line was effectively decommissioned with the founding of the Federation, later models appeared to have been commissioned as the Columbia or NX refit subclasses based on the influx of new technologies from the Alliance. The initial NX line therefore only existed for 10 years and saw at least four cannon vessels, 16 in Apocrypha, which seems a very short lifespan but as I said to begin with, the entire line was effectively a prototype for what was to come. Starfleet 2 could be considered to be the test version of the Federation Starfleet and the NX exemplified this innovation and development. In this light, the NX class was less of a starship in its own right and more of a decade-long research and development experiment that ended with the creation of the first wave of Federation vessels. With no NX class, it is not hyperbole to say that there would have been no UFP. It's fantastic to see this time in the Star Trek universe, as the ship pioneered the later developments that would become commonplace by the 23rd century, and definitely a sad thing to see the line end so soon. Aside from the secondary hull overhaul, there was another major refit planned to grant them new Duranium frames, but the rate of innovation was outstripping the NX class, leading to its retirement. While the NX was foundational to the creation of the United Federation of Planets, the emergence of this alliance was the death knell to the NX class. Unequivocally, the most important class in Star Trek lore. It's a fantastic vessel that served in a far greater capacity than expected of it, and it already had a lot riding on its shoulders. Thanks for watching this breakdown of the NX class starship. There is a lot more that I could go into, breaking down the origin of the class in real life as well as the entire in-universe project, so let me know if those are topics you'd be interested in. Until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later for another video. Goodbye.